Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Random Tea Sessions podcast. This is episode two, and I'm going to be playing a clip from an interview slash rehearsal that I did with Dan Shaney. We met a long time ago. We played together with the West Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, I played in his band, Polkadelphia. He played in my band, Wookie Delphia. We played some of his original music for the Philadelphia Jazz Project their series Mysterious Traveler. Um, his was called To the Library. We played at the Free Library of Philadelphia. All original music of his. So on this day we sit down and he watches me drink uh, Simmer Down Tea from the Random Tea Room. Also this episode is sponsored by Simmer Down from the Random Tea Room. This is calm in a cup so you'll drink it right up. Simmer Down Tea. So anyway, we talk about our past and future collaborations, playing in brass bands and working as professional musicians, talk about composers and films, we talk about the shelf lives of musical projects, and practicing and trying to take your own advice. We get into playing a little bit, we're actually uh, rehearsing his Fun A Day for January. Fun A Day is an art project where you just are making something every day, and he wrote these tuba grooves and we're turning some into duets and possibly using the loop pedal and we're performing on February 16th at the Random Tea Room. That's a Sunday. We're playing 5 to 7. If you listen long enough you'll hear a little snippet of that in the interlude. But if you want to hear the full recording of our rehearsal, the extended podcast, and the audio from the live recording you can support on Patreon, on Venmo, and on PayPal. I'll have links to all of that below. Or you can come see us on February 16th. Or you can come see us on February 16th. After the drums, you'll hear a clip of Dan Shaney and I talking about tea. It's very incensey in here. So we start with the hard-hitting questions. Sure. On the Random Tea Sessions podcast. Why aren't you drinking this tea? <laughs> um, that's, I don't have a good reason for not drinking the tea. Yeah, it's all good. But it, it, it feels, it looks like very good tea. It looks like tea I would enjoy. You want to check it out? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, it smells like incense. <laughs> mm. so, yeah, there was peppermint. Did and there was lavender. It's got all stuff that I like, and stuff I don't know, like motherwort, motherwort, and passion flower. But uh, yeah, it looks cool. I've been um, for a while. I've been excited about loose loose teas. Yeah. Oh, and I used to go kind of complicated, and more recently, I'm just like like a rooibos. That's like a little bit fruity. I like pure peppermint, and then everything else I like just like the straight up stuff. Yeah. Like a, a, the, my green is a jasmine pearl. Um, I've got, I got these two black ones from Seattle at this Asian grocery store, and they're it's gold dust and gold nugget, and what and they have descriptors for them. One is wild, silky, floral, and the other one is wild, caramel, full bodied. Is the nugget full bodied, and the dust is floral? God, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm gonna, I will check as soon Hard as I get hitting done. questions. <laughs> God, I would. I didn't do my homework. This is gotcha journalism. Ooh, at its best. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the dust is wild, silky floral, mm-hmm. which ca- of course makes sense. Yeah, you let me think like about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I like. And, and and that's mostly if, if I drink tea at all, it's generally what I'll drink. Mm-hmm. Except in the summer when I make like the most generic iced tea and it's still, lemon into it's it. It's still good. Oh, it's so good. Like Lipton's, like a, f- a couple of bags of Lipton's. Yes, yeah. or gen- even more generic. Yeah, it's like Wegman's generic. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Wegman's the sponsor. <laughs> uh, Wegman's actually has a very nice tea selection. Yeah, mm-hmm. like a loose oh, tea sure. selection. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Do you bag your own tea there, or they like, like have it in bags already? Both. Hmm. But yeah, you can. They have like giant bins. It's it's almost disturbing because it's all self serve, mm-hmm. and so like I feel like I mean like no one's trying to poison the tea supply, but yeah, but uh, you think a hair or two, yeah, that's probably right, or someone like <laughs> like that oh. sort of a thing. But you're gonna boil it anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you boil the water. That's why you boil the water. Because <laughs> you could do cold brew teas. Yeah, I used to, growing up, we, we used to do sun tea. Yeah, sun tea. Yeah. I never understood the concept of it. I think I tried to make it a few times as an adult. Mm-hmm. And it worked, but it's just like, oh, it's cold brew tea. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to drink some of this. You should do it. To prove that it's not poison. <laughs> <laughs> it's chamomile. Mugwort. Poison. <laughs> did I poison my glass or did I poison it? <laughs> you want to try it first? Oh, I get it now. Oh. Have, you, uh, have you ever seen the podcast You Suck at Cooking or the YouTube channel You Suck at Cooking? No. It's very good, but it's very silly. Like, like he does an episode about foraging and he's like, nah, you know, these berries, I'm not totally sure, but if you look and on the back of one of the leaves is a poison sticker. And he's like, yep, see, that's, <laughs> that's poison. You can't. Yeah. Or he'll like shake a, a leaf and Cheerios will fall out. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very funny. That's pretty good. Yeah. He's, he's great. He has a great one that I was thinking of because, you know, it was Super Bowl Sunday mm. and it's called Macho Nachos. And he's like, this macho for, for men only. So ladies, you're going to have to turn this off. Great. Now the first step is to moisturize and <laughs> tap your way over to the refrigerator. <laughs> Get your shade spreader out of your purse. If you, <laughs> my favorite part is, if you like nachos, that means you like sports. So let's get some of the colors for our favorite team. <laughs> Painting his nails. Nice. This is for the Arizona Glitterbacks, <laughs> the Revlon Coyotes. <laughs> it's worth checking out. Yeah. Sponsored by You Suck at Cooking. <laughs> Everything is a sponsor. Everything is sponsored <laughs> by YouTube and the Super Bowl. <laughs> this is our Super Bowl commercial. Yeah. <sighs> um, I played the show with Jay at the Tea Room, the first uh, of this series. Oh, cool. On Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, how'd it go? It went great. That's got awesome. Yeah. I completely forgot. Yeah. I remembered Groundhog Day. Yeah. Yeah. The, the more interesting of the two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Um, it was a good turnout. Yeah. And I guess you're inside. Yeah, we were inside. Mm-hmm. We'll probably move it outside, possibly, yeah. when it gets better out. Sure. Although I like the idea of it being inside and, like, switching the radio music to just us playing. Yeah. I've played inside there before, and it's super intimate and tiny mm-hmm. and I kind of appreciated that yeah like I appreciated the idea of amplification being ridiculous mm-hmm. I like I like sort of things like that and there was there's room for yeah there's room for like 15 20 people yeah there's a lot of standing not a lot of standing room but you could make some standing room sure sure especially like along by the counter if I'm th- if I'm thinking correctly yeah a lot um, of creative places to stand there. Yeah. Oh, you, there ha- has to be. Yeah. You stand <laughs> over by the trash can. Mm-hmm. Over by that stack of books. And then a little left to the stack of books. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the, the best acoustic spot in the in the entire space. Have you played there before? Yeah. Is it, who'd you play with? I played solo there. Um, I... There, it was, like, early in when I was doing songwriting... And singer I, songwriting, yeah, okay. singer and songwriting. And I was playing with a hot jazz band, and we happened to play aboard the Gazella. Mm-hmm. I remember and, that. Boat. And that's where I met Rebecca Rebecca, and randomly like reached out if I could play a thing, and did like an hour, an hour set, neon and shy. Nice. And that was fun. I forgot that we worked on the Gazella together. Yeah. That I think I was just thinking. Well, I was just talking to someone about working with those particular burlesque dancers mm-hmm. uh, with Lilu, Lilu Lenore and Renee Rebel, Rebel, Rebel. and um, and mentioning that I had done that. And then I was just thinking so fondly about that. That was that was such a fun show. Mm-hmm. That was a really fun 
like, I would just bike there. I left my stuff there. I would bike there. Yeah. Um, it was beautiful days in the, the end of summer. It was really, really cool. And, of course, uh, the thing I always remember is Francois Zayas. Yeah. Um, playing, playing with him and... Someone mentioned Mercury was in retrograde. <laughs> yeah. And he said in like his perfect accent, it's like every time I think of someone saying Mercury's in retrograde, I think of Freddie Mercury just sitting on the ground and scooting backwards. <laughs> like, oh, that's really great. Yeah. That is great to hear you say. Yeah, that, especially. We <laughs> never knew what was going on in his head, and I'm glad that's one of the things. Me too. Me too. Yeah, he, he's. Uh, I played his um, Kimmel Center concert. Yeah, yeah. And there have been plenty of times where he's been like he's very serious and intense musician, mm -hmm. and his sense of humor in that is just so was so funny. Yeah, was, like great, uh, like perfectly thrown darts. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and, and just a remarkable musician. Too. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. Like he kept a lot of that stuff quiet from WPO. Mm-hmm. Or, like, from just, like, us hanging out, you would never be like, hey, I'm playing at the Kimmel Center. Mm-hmm. They should come out. Yeah. I, I mean, like, yeah, I, I think that matches with the intensity that he he has. Mm-hmm. Um, but the man, can he play maraca solo? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a piece for XPN under the, the title of, like, Other Instruments to Play and walk around Philadelphia like Andre played the, his flute well. <laughs> That's right, I saw that, yeah. And, uh, yeah, one of them was Maracas, and I linked to that, to one of his videos where he just, it's kind of ridiculous. It is. I didn't realize, and he's playing it, I realized that you can play it kind of like a snare drum, like rudiments, mm -hmm. and you have, like, bounce back also, mm -hmm. because the beats have to go somewhere. They don't just stop, they have to rebound. Right. Yeah, yeah. The, the way that he's able to create a beat that is not the standard <laughs> maraca beat. I mean, I know you can do more than that, but I didn't know you can do that much. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. when I was when I was in my early twenties in L.A., I remember I was I was staying out there or living out there, and there was a guy who passed. It was a musical household that we were in, and there was a guy who passed through who had like. Those maracas that were on a string with each other, and so like you could like you flip spin, them, yeah. and they would hit each other, mm -hmm. and that whole thing. And he did just amazing stuff with that. And I feel so bad that I could neither remember the person nor the in name of the instrument itself. The instrument has forever become that thing that like the, with the yeah the eggs on the string. Yeah. Um, I remember watching a video about it, but I don't remember the name. Mm -hmm. But just seeing how intricate you can. It's like a a ball on a str or like a cup and ball, mm -hmm. but musical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, it really like makes for because you can flip it just about any time you want as long as you're you can get like really like polyrhythms and stuff there. Yeah, uh, a lot of, of like mixed meter stuff. And that was really that was super cool. Mm -hmm. If you know you you practiced it. <laughs> yeah, and know the name of it. Yes. <laughs> Going into music stores for the for the last twenty years. You guys have that string. Uh, <laughs> oh, the cup of the cup and the string, the cup, cup of the balls, balls. cup of balls. No. Yeah. I've been. I've found. I've only found them at the Constitution Center. <laughs> <laughs> that and the the wheel that you hit with the stick. Whatever happened to that? And how was that a game? Yeah, <laughs> I think you. I think that was that answers the question. <laughs> Exa exactly. Hey, you guys want to watch me run with a wheel and a stick? Mm -hmm. I'll hit it every once in a while. Yeah. Great. Oh, my turn. <laughs> I wonder if in the future. <laughs> I wonder if in the future, in the same way that we create like learning, learning computers that like you give them a vocabulary or give them time to to learn, like Super Mario Brothers, mm -hmm. and it can beat the game in learning what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. If there'll be a real life thing of how it does that with the stick. It seems like a way to go backwards. <laughs> like I think Super Mario Brothers is more interesting. Like a like a like a Westworld kind of like old robot. Yeah. Like a robot dressed in like old gear but still running along with the stick 
but as perfectly. As, it, as long as it has a badge. It needs to have a badge. Oh, I didn't watch what Westworld. Either. Okay. <laughs> I was just going with it. <laughs> All right. But yeah, it'll have a badge. It'll say, uh, well, what is that game called? Stick and, stick and wheel? Stick wheel. Run, mm-hmm. run stick wheel? <laughs> It's some combination of those. Yeah. I feel like it was like John Ferris. Oh. It was Ferris's wheel. Oh. And that's then, what that is. Yeah. Maybe that's the automated version of it. Mm-hmm. The perfect automated version of it. Because oh. you don't need to run with it. You can just sit. You don't... And I guess maybe the motor is the stick? A virtual stick? The virtual stick. Or oh. the virtual running little boy. My dad, my dad used to always tell me um, he always had the fantasy of a Ferris wheel just rolling along, yeah, like a beach. Yeah, <laughs> on a beach. Yeah, on a beach. I think because I think he was thinking in the context of like Atlantic City or oh, yeah. something like that. But yeah, just and plus, if it's on a beach, I mean, there's fewer obstacles that it can hit. Yeah. Besides the ocean and uh, <laughs> and if it, piers. I feel like if it rolls into the ocean, it's kind of a soft. Landing yeah. for the people inside. For the people up top. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not like strapped in, so you just kind of float out. Oh yeah. yeah. While it's rolling. Right. So is it the like the, cen- the centripetal force that holds you in as it's spinning? I'm imagining kind of like a. Uh, um, what are those wheels on a on a, on a mill? Oh, uh, mill wheels. No, no uh, water wheels. Water wheels. Yeah. I feel like there's a windmill. I guess some people call them windmill. No. No. Because that's <laughs> the wind thing that yeah. runs the so mill. Mill, mill, mill. Because the windmill could run the, right. the water yes. wheel. No, windmill could run the mill, but the water is the... is Okay, so that's a water mill. Because <laughs> it's doing the same thing, but with water yeah. instead of wind. Uh-huh. Is there a fire mill? Or an earth mill? <laughs> or a heart, a heart mill? In Dungeons and Dragons, there is. There's a fire mill? Yeah, fire mill. I can see it with lava. Mmm. Lava mill. Lava mill. That's, that's what they have at the end of uh, episode three of. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Lava mill. From um, so far. And also, every one of my podcast episodes is going to mention Star Wars at least three times. All right, well then. <laughs> Check. That was one. Okay. I've been looking at the, the Finn helmet, though, so... That, yeah. That, we can count that as one and a half. One and a half. Uh-huh. And then, to get up to two... Remember Wookie Delphia? I do. <laughs> um, we actually had a show. Yeah? <laughs> we, we played a show um, about two or three weeks ago. Right. Uh, a private party sort of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it was it was fine, although... I hadn't played that stuff in a while, and I hadn't played sousaphone in a while, mm-hmm. and I think I played it in such a way that um, it set me back playing wise a little bit. Mm. Like I felt, I can see that. Like overly fatigued. I felt like I was playing too loud mm-hmm. um, and not playing carefully, and so that that was kind of a frustrating thing. But yes, yes, I do. I do remember Philadelphia. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what where where it goes from from yeah, here. But. Yeah, I'm going a few different directions, keeping a few pins. Sure. Um, one of the pins is where it goes from here. The other one is playing too loud and in, in ensembles and mm-hmm. like. That's actually you know when I um, when I speak of you, to mm-hmm. other people, that's something that I talk about as uh, uh, attention to dynamics in a way that. Uh, makes playing very easy um, is something that I really appreciate about your playing. Thanks. Sure. I remember. Oh, it was. Um, we played that. Well, we played a Philadelphia show in Cape. No, in in Wildwood, like two years ago. Mm-hmm. And I remember that it was all of the less in your face people in the band. Oh yeah. I think so. Was that at the? At a brewery? Yeah. It was yeah. The, at the Mudhead and Brew Pub. I remember that. Yes. Sponsored by the Mud... Mudhead? The Mud... Mud Hen. Mud Hen. <laughs> mud... Hen. Sponsor, sponsored by someone in... Yeah. In Atlantic City. Wild, muddy, Wild waters. muddy Waters. Muddy Waters. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, that, and it's, it's funny. That, that band is always funny because depending on who you get, that can be like 
giant boisterous band, or mm-hmm. it can be like the super low key band. Yeah. Or, or people who've played the music twice and are like, oh my god, what are we doing? Yeah. I tend to like the medium to lower volume gigs. Me too. And I'm finding especially because um, I sometimes have a hard time hearing myself because of the bell positioning of the instruments that I play. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a hard time either hearing myself or hearing myself clearly. So, in a and when I can play someplace where I feel acoustically centered, that's such a relief. Yeah. Well, I guess that seems kind of obvious, but it, it, it happens less frequently than I would like. And I get done evenings being like, I just played as loud as possible so I could just hear myself. Yeah. And that's one of the troubles with, like, giant bands or bands that aren't as sympathetic to listening and mm-hmm. other people's comfort. Mm-hmm. In playing, yeah, it's, it's like also everybody starts to play louder. I had this. I remember learning this in like marching band, is that if everybody starts to play louder so that they can hear themselves, then everybody keeps playing louder. Right, right. The feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. That's it's frustrating. Um, I'm finding. I guess it happens a couple different ways. Like I'm finding a very acoustic settings can be really nice. Although sometimes I do like I was playing fume. Uh, the other day, or a a month ago, and I just could not hear myself. And because of the positioning of the other instruments, and Mm -hmm. because of where I was, it was just like, I don't even know if I can be heard. Um, And also because um, of the amplification of the guitar. Like, one thing's amplified, then I'm just like, I don't know what I can do. Yeah. Um, Which sometimes, like, if, like, is either resolved where no one's amplified, or everyone's, like, very balanced amplified, Mm -hmm. I find. Um, when I used to play in the in the David Bowie band, and I'd just like take a microphone and jam it down the bell and just turn the bass amp up a lot. Yeah, there was something really empowering about that as yeah. well. Where you just like you barely have to touch it, or even with WPO, when I would plug into that bass amp, if I could turn it up enough, mm-hmm. it would be I could play nice and quiet the entire. Yeah, but that's a little. That's kind of the same thing as. You you have a comfortable volume, right. but you have the amplification to to match right. what everyone else is putting out, right? And you can still feel comfortable while having that like that sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel especially when I have a a really hot microphone, I can really like just get close to it and play soft. But if I really need to play loud, like back off a little bit and like give it to it, and it. It speaks and I can hear myself and it feels good. That's, that's such a relief. Yeah, I feel like a, a few places on tour were like that. What was that place we played in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. The I, the Mexican restaurant. Yeah. That's all I remember. The Mexican restaurant with Cantina. all of the Something Cantina. Russian people? Yes. Owned by Russian people? I, at that point, that was my last show of the of the tour. And also, I was developing lots of canker sores at that point, so I played like the first like three songs, and I was like, I can't do it. Oh yeah, I'm done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, I I didn't play most of that one, but yes, I I know what you're talking about. That that was definitely a, a well amplified. Yeah, and then another pin was from tour seeing the. Did you see that brass band that played pretty much every night in New Orleans? I don't think I did. Hmm. I, I don't understand it anymore. Like I feel like I used to have, I used to be able to like play loud all day and not like. Of course, my lips would be tired at the end of the day, but like, yeah. The next day, do it again. Next day, do it again. But like now, I just appreciate playing soft and like don't have it in my constitution to play that loud or to be that noticed. I guess I I really understand that playing loud in a healthy way has been really challenging for me like playing loud in a way that tone works but then but I, I mean I also think of that in the context of like some of the Mummers bands where it, the idea is how can you be that loud band that's just blasting on the street yeah and that's a point of pride yeah and I'm like same, what? <laughs> same with some of the um, some of the New Orleans brass bands not specifically be that loud band but be loud and clear yeah. and be able have people be able to hear your 
your intricacies for blocks away. Yeah. I I, I feel like mummer, the mummers aren't worried about their intricacies as much as a wall of bagpipey sound. Yeah, that's... Well, when your audience is, um, you know, 215-year-olds drunk on Miller Lite, then you don't, might not need to be as... <laughs> it might, little, little, might be over the top to mm-hmm. focus on that intricacy. Yeah, you have to make it big. Yes. Yeah, I, I, there's a part of me that feels, like, not great about that, too. I, it's stuff that I reconcile, like, there is, there's work out there for that. And there's parts of it that can sound really cool. Like, when I hear some people playing those, like, kind of, those big sounds and just able to uh, pump them out. Mm-hmm. Like, um, Tony Zoo style. Yeah. Like, that, there's something really, um... Overwhelming and impressive. And impressive, especially the trumpet player. Well, for me, he can just he could just play so loud for so long, and so consistently, and you couldn't tell that he'd been playing for two hours. Mm-hmm. It's it impressive. Me, it may, also makes me think about like um, when people talk about like Serbian weddings. Yeah, those too. <laughs> that are just like this is just what you do. Yeah. Or even mari- like mariachi sort of things. Mm-hmm. Where you get paid by you get you get an hourly rate, <laughs> like, with, you know what I mean. It's not like obviously you get paid X amount for an hour, but it's like oh, I mean you get you're you're in the band, you get about fifty dollars an hour, and we're gonna play for I don't know how about seven hours. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I had from like drum corps and marching band had that kind of intensity, and yeah. like I could play for hours and play loud, but. I guess you couldn't get the other. I couldn't get the other side as easily. Like right. When I'm stuck in playing loud for a month or a year or whatever, it's harder to pl- play a ballad. Yeah. Or get like sensitivity when you're playing soft. Yeah, and that's. I guess you know sometimes those are traps that I fall into, uh, uh, like pitfalls of impossible standards, which like you know I've I've learned so much. Be the musician that can do anything. Yeah. Like, don't just be the person who can do this. And and there are definitely styles of music that are so much harder to play. And as I get older, I think I don't really want to play that. Like, yeah. that doesn't super appeal to me. Like, and then I go through that. Oh my god, am I being a shitty musician? Yeah. Am I being a musician who's like totally like cutting themselves off from possible from possibilities? But I mean, I'm also at a place where I don't take every gig anymore, and that's something I used to do, so that could be just an extension of that, yeah. and it should be. You know, you're getting to know what you like, yeah. or you know what you like. Yeah. You know what you're willing to sell to other people. Right. Right, which is kind of like what we were talking about before, also, that, um, the, I think we were talking about that, this, the, like, As as I make music my profession, figuring out what enables me to do that, to actually do that mm-hmm. and uh, survive, and picking and choosing around there, and then taking a step back years later and being like, well, do I want to do that? Like, yes, I can take um, $50 gigs every day of the week, and that will get me through the month. Mm-hmm. Four four hour fifty dollar gigs, um, but do I want to do that? Can, can I physically do that? Do I want to do that? Is that sustainable? Yeah, and if it is sustainable, what does that mean for music? <laughs> <laughs> and then so the, those are the terrifying questions I I'm constantly asking. <sighs> very upsetting questions. Yeah. Oh, that made my neck tight. <laughs> <laughs> Get some more tea. More yeah, tea. simmer down. That's right. That mugwort, that's what that's right there. Mm. Yeah, you could really taste the mugwort. Yeah. No, that's not true. <laughs> if you only you knew what it tasted like. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Baby It's Cold Outside. Yeah. And since then, the YouTuber that put out the video about sexual assault on men played for laughs, put out another one. I saw that with, for, for, uh, when women are assaulted. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see the thing, but I saw that that had uh, come out. Yeah. I want to watch it again. He specifically brought up Baby It's Cold Outside and the musical that it's from and that it actually happens two times in the musical. The first time is, like, with these two really slick-looking, like, beautiful um, a guy and a girl. And it's the one that we've heard and maybe seen a clip of. And then later on in the musical, they do the opposite, where it's a guy that's trying to leave and a woman is trying to keep him in her house. Mm -hmm. But it's played for laughs more than, like... I guess it's played for laughs because the first one is the normal. yeah. And um, there's the, the idea that both women can't be predators. Yeah. Don't all guys want sex all the time? Yeah. But, like, he's a little... He's, like, rounder and kind of that funny archetype of the funny fat guy. And he leaves eventually wearing her jacket and, like, a little bonnet and does a little, like, jump and shout and, like, yeah. and tries to get back in. Some, like, Matt... Plays on toxic masculinity. Yeah. It plays on if you don't want sex all the time, you must be feminine. Yeah. Yeah. That's really upsetting. Yeah. <laughs> and the lady is a little less slick and sleek. She's a little more frazzled and frantic. Was some great alliteration from me. That was good. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, upsetting and interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was interesting that it came out, like, right after we talked. Yeah, that is funny. Um, I think I mentioned this last time that he also wrote uh, a polka tune that I recently transcribed. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's oh, called yeah. hoop dee doo It's a Frankie, Frankie uh, Yankovic hmm. tune. hoop dee doo hoop dee doo I hear a polka and my troubles are through. Okay. And I was transcribing it, and like, then I went to see who wrote it. I'm like, really? Huh. This guy got around. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, songwriters from the, what, 30s, 40s, 50s? Mm -hmm. They indeed did get around. Yeah. <laughs> I got a song for you right here. <laughs> I feel like that could be uh, soundtrack composers right now. Oh, yeah? They're all getting... I feel like there's a good recycling of them in Hollywood. Sure. I, mean, I guess that's just Hollywood. Sure, uh, sure. And but then I think about like I think about Steve Rice, uh, who is breaking into that. And so like there's all there's there is that main component of things, and then there's all like this undercurrent. Or also I think about um, uh, a friend of mine that I went to uh, the Mancini Institute with is out there now. Um, and he's a composer, but does a ton of arranging. And, and, like, when there is, like, a John Williams score, it's like, John Williams wrote this stuff. And these 25 people wrote the arrangements that, mm -hmm. that are what it actually, uh, what made the music happen. Yeah. Yeah, I've been hearing about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't entirely understand the process. I mean, I feel like, I feel like with those sorts of things, from what I've seen, it is, like, a lot of, like, just problem-solving components. Of course, there's a creative component to it. But, like, there's a lot of, like, so we need, to, we need, of course, like, a 
three minute thing to go from here to here or 30 mm -hmm. second thing to go from here to here and it has to have this sort of thing it has to tie this theme in right here go yeah I feel like there's no way to go from John Williams to <laughs> I don't know so that's uh, that's at least three mm -hmm. mentions of Star Wars today. There we go. We got him. <laughs> we got him. <laughs> but yeah, hearing stories about episode three and like the big climax and how it was written for specific scenes to play out like one by one, but then George Lucas or one of the editors like had to cut it up for it to make sense and like splice them all together so that the soundtrack is just a bunch of different like fully composed songs but kind of smashed together mm. with like a little bit of duct tape which I feel like a, these assistants had to like force in there. Sure, yeah, like oh we need to, we need the transposition back to where this is yeah. or the texture goes here or no this is the Emperor scene so we need Yeah. That's interesting. And I would, it th sounds cool. Yeah. Like it sounds like a cool, a, a kind of a fun job. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely like those kind of puzzle jobs. Mm. Like, where you're given two things and you have to connect them yep. the best way that you can using your knowledge of musical theory yeah. and math. Yeah. Mm. But I feel like also there are a lot of artists, bigger name artists, that don't do their own work anymore. They're just kind of concept. Yeah. Like, Banksy didn't build that whole theme park. He just thought of it and told them what to do. Oh, very suspicious. But there are a lot of artists like that. Yeah, I, get, I mean, it is the... That branding component. Yeah. You know, that Franchising. Brand. Yeah. <laughs> Branchising. <laughs> it fits in with making everything kind of bite size, mm -hmm. everything palatable, everything digestible. And it's, I, I mean, like, it's easy to go to there. Not like it was, you know, but like, there's so many advantages that there's so much great stuff that can come from that, like, yeah. in terms of a collaboration that a singular artist might have a more challenging and slower and might not even get there with yeah, things. So. Might not even finish it without other people. So there's I think there's certainly bonuses to it. I I I think it to the exclusion of the individual can be really um dehumanizing, but uh I think those things are happening. Yeah. I mean maybe I wish oh, go ahead. Sorry. Every once in a while I wish I could be just a content thinker. Mm-hmm. Instead of, like, actual... I'll just create the idea, and then you guys figure it out, because it's a really good idea. <laughs> you guys figure it out. Maybe give me some money when you start making money. Cheese-flavored pants. Yeah. Go! Perfect. <laughs> uh, socks made out of dog food. Yeah. So, so like, at the end of the day, you just yeah. take your shoes off? And... Yeah, your dogs are going to eat your socks anyway, maybe? Yeah. Oh, my God. Or, like, whatever your dog eats of yours, we will customize and make that biodegradable, edible, and put seeds in there so when your dog poops it out, oh flowers will grow. And the flowers are made of the same meat. Mm. And then you can make the same. The yeah, somebody GMO some meat flowers. Yeah. <laughs> Copyright. That's How do it. we copyright that's something? That's right. <laughs> Quick. Mail, mail this recording to uh, <laughs> the patent office. Meat flowers. I'll just <laughs> write them a letter that just says meat flowers. That's They'll a, get it. That's a good band name. Yeah. Should that be our band name? Meat flowers. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think not. It's, good. it's a good band name. For someone else. For someone else. else. <laughs> oh, and then the, um, the other pin that I will take out is... Where Wookie Delphia goes, if they're yeah, if there's still a need or like a want for that kind of you know. I mean, I have I have thoughts about it. I feel like kind of like with the Eagles band, mm -hmm. Eagles of Delphia. <laughs> you know, the Eagles band, the Eagles. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a good skill set and vocabulary to have. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's something that, like, can be pulled out. And as a standalone, like, promotable component, I don't know that it has really great legs. Yeah. Um, or it also just could be that the content is finite, is quite finite. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to... It, it, that can be frustrating 
as a performer. And we're like, all right, I'm doing this thing again. Mm, I don't know if it's finite. The, um, the in terms of the material, that's I, I mean, I guess you can extend on it to some extent. Yeah, but like, but there's there's canon and non-canon and the Mandalorian. And sure. Which, Which, and all the new stuff that's about to come out. I guess that's true. I, I guess, you, you, you know, like, maybe it was those iconic themes from the original trilogy mm -hmm. that, of course, we've had decades to incorporate into our collective culture. Yeah. Um, so that when we get to um, the prequels, at least in terms of how we approached this in Wikadelphia, there are like one tune, maybe two tunes that we pulled from there. And it's great. Duel of the Fates is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really great tune. But like, and I guess we would quote the, uh, the Anakin love theme. Yeah. But in itself, it's not a great theme. Mm. Uh, I don't think. And then there wasn't a whole lot outside of that that we really did there. And then in the new ones, we took a couple of them. Yeah. But like, but like nothing as iconic as the stuff from the original trilogy. Yeah. Uh, maybe in forty years, probably not. <laughs> but uh, just because I mean, I said it not because it's not good. It's just in oversaturation of media and and like when's the last time we heard an absolutely iconic soundtrack like one that five ten years later. Mm -hmm. Everyone's still like that's that tune. That's awesome. Well, I think that the the, the niches are just getting smaller. Mm. Like yeah. people are getting there. There's a there are some people that are still loyal to Star Wars, even though we've kind of grown past it. Even or like I don't know. I guess my loyalty to Star Wars was Wookie Delphia for the most part, and then a little bit past then, I've just been paying attention because now it's. Now I'm hooked. Yeah. And there's a lot of other people hooked to, like, the mythology and how long it's been going on. Yeah. And I, I, all of the new, like, I talked to Jay about the Jedi Fallen Order, the video game. Mm, right. That he said, like, people really like and has a very compelling story. And I've, I've seen commercials for that. That's And I'm sure there's a bunch of different music for that. I don't know that they stole, or used, not stole, because yeah. they own it, but, like, I don't know. Well, and, and you brought up Mandalorian, too, which I think, for a lot of people, um, was, like, a return to roots. Um, just, like, a very kind of simple story, not a really com hugely convoluted thing. Like, even, even, like, the outcomes, which I'm not going to get into, but, like, even, like, like, there were a few little twists. But mm -hmm. nothing that was just like, oh my god, this was actually this. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of like the style and in terms of the music, like there was great music in that. Yeah. And that's the, I mean, that's the first time I've felt that way about a a Star Wars product in a while. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would say that is true about Clone Wars and Rebels. Like a lot of people are very devoted to those, and I've I've watched some of it. And some of it's entertaining, although at least where I was watching in Clone Wars, it was seemed a little bit more geared towards younger people. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, it is, it's canon, and they're making more of those. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it is turning around in a way that can be, I mean, like, I'm not going to say Star Wars isn't relevant, and it's definitely not even not relevant to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think it felt like, you know, it also could be that... Uh, and this is something I struggle with a ton. Uh, I've always struggled with. You work really hard to create a product. Yeah. Um, and then you have that product. And you have to figure out how long you hold onto that product before you do something else. Yeah. Um, and it can be really challenging, especially if it's a successful product. And it's hard to, to do the work of innovation and creativity that can keep it alive. Mm -hmm. a and I can see there's some sense that there's a sense of plug and play. Uh, or some sense of that. Uh, you know, a bunch of the bands that I've uh, been in, I mean, is part of a successful career. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, it's, there's pieces of it. Because if you're constantly creating, it can be, it, it can be too much. And like, even the idea, like, it's, it's also my, my favorite, uh, like, Euro board game trope, mm 
<laughs> which is like there's often a resource acquiring and a re- resource spending component of it. Yeah. And do you move from the resource acquiring to the spending as quickly as possible, or do you hoard those resources and get a really big one, but in the meantime not have the moment momentum? Yeah. That's pretty uh, oblique <laughs> reference, but but like it's something that I think about in terms of performance. Like I can always remember. Um, I remember when I was in college. I remember I wanted to go on tour to various different colleges, which is super presumptuous for like a twenty-year-old. But I was like, I just want to go to different places and play mm-hmm. because I was like, I want to try spending these resources. Yeah, I want to try like see what that has to offer and that sort of creation of things. Mm-hmm. Um, had I done that, I'm sure it would have been a great learning experience and it would not have gone well. I'm 100% sure of that. Um, especially because, like, in the context of today, trying to figure out, like, how do you make that actually work? How do you optimize that? Yeah. But even, like, the concept of optimization, like, how much do you optimize and how much do you do? <laughs> That's why I don't do anything. Yeah. That's why a lot of us don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it could be better. Yeah. <laughs> Let me wait wait until it's better. I I think about uh, the saying, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Yeah. And I think about how, what I try to impart to students too, like, I'd I'd rather they be doing something and creating something than creating anything good. Yeah. (laughs) It's so much more important to be creating than to creating something good, because until you're creating, you can't create anything good. Yeah. I was just having this conversation this morning and um, remember listening to a Dan Harmon's podcast. One of them is titled The Enemy is Stopping. Yeah. And it was um, Dan Harmon and Open Mike Eagle freestyling together and then breaking down like, oh, I get into my crutches and I just kind of do the same thing. And he's like, well, yeah, just you just have to work past your crutches. You have to get your crutches out. You have to wear them down until they're just nubs. I guess that's an analogy. Yeah, and also bring that. That's that's really. <laughs> it's encouraging and upsetting because mm-hmm. it brings up like this weird paradox that I can't tell if it's just a reason I convince myself not to practice. <laughs> you know, we practice something to get better, but we can only practice the things that we can play. So where does the progress go? <laughs> like, sure, certainly it comes in the mistakes and then the mistakes moving out of that. But, like, there's times where I'll be practicing and it will feel terrible and sound terrible. And mm-hmm. I just think to myself, am I practicing playing bad? <laughs> well, a way to think about it is you could have built the Eiffel Tower. You would just need a lot of time and a lot of resources and you could have done it one man mm-hmm. if you had years and years. You can also play any piece of music. Like, I could play Flight of the Bumblebee on piano really, really slowly. Like I can do it perfectly right. at one BPM. Sure. So, like, you can do that with all of the music that you're given, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. You know all the notes. You know how it's supposed to sound. And I think it's just the, the time... And, like, the the speed and the tempo. I've gotten the most out of practicing by really breaking it down and going as slow as possible and making sure everything speaks at the slow tempo and then bumping it up. You mean the exact same thing I tell all my students applies to me, too? (laughs) No, but you're different. (laughs) Because you're the person that you are. Yeah. No, no, it's, that's true. <laughs> it's very true. I also have this conversation a lot. Like, yeah. I'm so good at giving other people... I can give people the be- best advice that, like, oh, yeah, just don't think of it this way. Think of it that way. And then when I'm actually in that same headspace, I can't get out of it. Yeah. Or I can... Or, like, I think of it and I'm like, well, I'm too smart to... To have to think about that. Uh, so upsetting. Yeah. But that's so many people. Yeah. You can tell other people how to raise their children, but once you have them, it, like, you kind of forget about all of that stuff. Or it's in the back of your mind, but you're like, I don't have time to right. actually do that. Wait, you can tell other people how to raise their children? This is awesome! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go try it. Sweet! 
You should have that kid on a leash. <laughs> have you um have you watched Bojack yet? Yeah. Oh wait, is the finale? No. <laughs> You should watch Tell that. me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you you should watch that. There's some. It's it. Um, I felt like for almost the complete most part, there was no compromise. Which you know, like it, 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 that, that's not a spoiler in any way. Like mm. it just it stayed true to the vision and it stayed true to uh, respecting the characters and. Uh, developing the characters, mm -hmm. um, which is something I've I've admired about the show. Yeah, I, I it, it manifests uh, in the early episodes of the consistency between episodes. Like the moment the Hollywood thing yeah. happens, from then on, I'm just, I was just like, I am so on board for this because this is these are not static characters. Yeah, um, and Every, it's not afraid to make those changes. Make big changes. Yep, and sit with it for they never fix that sign, do they? Uh, yeah, and the, the, um, the, there was, there was, uh, one in the, in the second season where he, he met the woman who was, uh, in a coma. Mm hmm I just remember that also because I, I, I loved watching the opening sequences. Yeah. Because she was in a couple of them, like, if she's in it, then she's a serious character in here. Yeah. And then she wasn't. Mm hmm And that didn't, have, then five seasons later, she's still not in it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like... Okay, yeah, that's that's uncompromising. You yeah, know what I mean, people can show up for a few episodes and then be gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She also has maybe one of the best lines in the, in the show, which is the, I, I guess when you're seeing someone through uh, rose-colored glasses, yeah, all the all the red flags just look white. All the red flags just look like flags. Yeah, yeah, Oof. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Each season, I feel like, has some really powerful episodes, and the last eight has some pretty powerful things. And it goes places that I didn't really expect, um, but it's really true to the character. It's really true to the integrity of the whole thing. You should go check it out. I, I will. Yeah. Probably as soon as you leave. I know. I, wa <laughs> I watched it all in, in one night, or Colleen and I watched it all in one night. Watched the whole season? or So they they had the first eight yeah, yeah. And then... The they, finale episode. So they did, um... The last eight. The eight? Yeah. Damn! <laughs> I was ready for just one. Yeah, no. Uh, you're right. The way they ended eight, they could have done that. But no. No, there are eight episodes and... Oh, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand you're, the face that you made earlier. Yeah. Yeah, you're... You're, you're not ready. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ready. Yeah, but it's it's really great. Uh, so yeah, there's something that I think about in that that I'm not going to bring up because mm -hmm. it's too much of a spoiler. But like there there's concepts of that that do come up of creativity and how we perceive ourselves and those sorts of things. Yeah, that are really that really spoke to me a lot. Yeah, it's it, it's weird how that a cartoon can speak to you so much. I always think my, my my one friend in talking about that show said it had the most accurate depiction of intergenerational dementia I've ever seen. Yeah. And I was like, I know what you're talking about, and yes. Yeah. No, that blew my mind and gave me, like, I hadn't dealt with much dementia, but I had an aunt that came to stay with us for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I forgot about it for a long time and mm. like how bad that could be yeah and yeah even, even the, just just the scribbles like yeah that that tiny concept was just really yeah the scribbles over uh, people's faces yeah it's just like oh okay oh and yeah. it all comes back like why she's been calling uh yeah. bojack whatever someone else's name yeah but also the mother okay yeah yeah but also the spoilers. Everybody the should watch <laughs> Bojack. Yeah, I think so. And I've been going back to. We should play a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I've been going back to all of the the impetus of my adult cartoon or cartoons for adults. <laughs> yeah, that's a better way to say it. <laughs> oh, we're going here. All right. Yeah. Um, um, like like what? 
So I started with home movies. Yeah. Then Dr. Katz. Yeah. It's a weird show. Yeah, very weird. But now I love it. It's oh, great. I, I just rewatched, about a month ago, I rewatched the entire thing. Yeah. They're all on YouTube. They're all on YouTube. And there's some, so, such amazing things in there. Yeah. Like, the humor is so, so dry. Yeah. John Katz is one of oh. the best uh, comedians. Yeah. Best dry comedian. Oh my god, it's so great, and like the way that H. John Benjamin can do that as well. Yeah, and and still be the comedian to Doctor Katz's straight man, if that's even the paradigm we're looking at. God, yeah, it's hard. It is. Yeah, it's it's not quite that. It's but it's like that, but with a touch of absurdity in the yeah. the whole thing. And then taking some of that into home movies. Mm-hmm. Um. Then Bob's Burgers and. Archer are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But, like, I feel like those improv, those more improv ones. Sure. Home movies and Dr. Katz. I can't really think of many other ones. Re- retro, they call it retroscoping? Or not? That's a squiggle like, vision? <laughs> it's squiggle vision, but it's retroscripting. Oh, retroscripting. Not scoping. That's a yeah. Thing. But, yeah, where they basically talk through what they're going to do and then improvise it mm-hmm. and then animate that. Yeah. I feel like that was what Adult Swim was born on. Sure, yeah. Yes, I very much so. And then even shows like, um, was the rest of development like that? No, not quite. I don't quite. think so, no. No. Well, so, Curb, uh, Curb, Curb, that's what I'm thinking of. Is it going to be unscripted like Curb? That's a line <laughs> from Arrested Development. <laughs> 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 Which, uh, also, Curb is coming back, apparently. It's going to hear I kind of fell off a while ago. I have a hard time watching that. There's only so much I can listen to people argue without yeah. being like, just don't say a word and you'll be fine. Yeah. I get some of that at work. Yeah. Like some people are just natural contrarians. Like whenever you say anything to them, it's like, no, but I was going to. Or no, but I knew that already. And I was like, if you just say, sure, fine. Even if you know it already. That's the end of the conversation. That's that's the, uh, there's the Mitch Hedberg joke that a friend of mine asked me if I thought the weather was trippy, and I said, no, perhaps it's not the weather that's trippy, perhaps it is a perception of the weather that is trippy. And then I realized I just should have said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's another, not Dimitri Martin, I think the guy who wrote Sleepwalk with me. Oh, uh, Mike Birbiglia? Yeah. I think he has a a sketch or something where he's like, he was moving into a new apartment and he was moving the mattress in and some lady was in the elevator and she was like, oh, I'm not worried that you're moving in because a rapist wouldn't have such a good mattress. (laughs) And he's like, what I should have said was nothing. (laughs) What I did say was you'd be surprised. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so one of the things I've been working on uh, is this is that continuation of the Groove Project. Oh yeah. Um, Where did you were you just sharing that on Instagram or? I was sharing on Facebook briefly. Uh, like for the, I did only did five back in 2018, mm-hmm. and then I went on vacation and lost momentum for it. But it's been my fun day this year. Okay. So. Uh, so you have okay. twenty. I went to 23, I did 23 right. today, and like some of them are really bad, and some of them are really great and fun, and some of them straddle the line between a melodic sort of thing and a bass line, I'm being really liberal with what groove is, mm-hmm. but um, it's been really fun.